Right. Right. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, I'd love to talk more about that. Okay, so, ladies and gentlemen, so we're going to uh, get started here. Um, we're going to uh, go over quickly um, some material conceptually to try to make sense of, of what we've seen without uh, belaboring this to death. Um, uh, because so much of the boot camp is hands-on, I want to make sure that we don't uh, shortchange those hands-on opportunities. But I do want to, to to frame things. You know, in terms of um, what I see is, and particularly for this lecture, um, I have a somewhat different take on modeling than uh, many you'll find out there. Um, particularly this notion of, of modeling as as learning prostheses, learning uh, learning tools. Um, and uh, I felt it was important to sort of frame things so you'll have a sense of where I'm coming from this boot camp. So, you know, my context in this work and motivations for being drawn to this work is that, you know, in, in public health arena, we, we are confronting ever more complex health challenges, um, dealing with situations where, you know, we formulate policies, but, but we get blowback. And in classic examples, antibiotic resistant organisms, right? Um, or, uh, and, and it could be in the use in the food chain and could be in the context of, of medical overuse of antibiotics. But um, we see a lot of cases where um, policies that were well formulated or well, well intentioned certainly have, um, have not yielded all the gains originally hoped. Um, we're also confronted increasingly by troubling syndemics, cases where chronic and communicable disease interact um, for example, on the H1N1 front, the, uh, the uh, interesting interaction of uh, obesity, H1N1, um, TB, and diabetes is one that we've done quite a bit of work in, um, and other researchers are, are interested in. Um, uh, the interaction of substance abuse, crime, property, and suicide, which is so troubling in many of our northern communities. Um, uh, we also, of course, are dealing with the the, the aging of, of the baby boomers and, and the, the very real status that um, you know, comorbid conditions are increasingly becoming uh, the norm rather than the exception. Um, and of course, uh, many of us are grappling with the challenges associated with One Health and, and zoonoses that cross the animal-human human barrier and, and emerging infectious diseases, ones that perhaps before were the province of um, of uh, distant areas of the world with little little contact uh, where the worldwide travel but are increasingly due to development and worldwide travel enmeshed within um, uh, our uh, within within our world uh, writ large um, many other aspects that make you know today's health challenges different from those of our of, of our forebears um, and you know, traditional techniques have secured tremendous insights in certain areas, um, and I would include here, you know, the, the RCTs we look to for, for many types of drugs, um, uh, pathway-specific lab studies um, that, have, that have helped us understand um, the ways in which uh, certain, certain factors uh, play a role at a clinical level. Um, Large-scale epi studies, uh, we make heavy, heavy use of uh, of epi studies based, for example, on, on uh, admin data and longitudinal studies um, uh, that, that can give uh, strong insights into certain, the role of risk factors, um, and statistical analyses uh, as conducted in, in many different ways. But these techniques broadly um, uh, are, are valuable in supporting an understanding of how pieces of the system um, um, are, are, are made, are, are, are shaped. And broadly, I'd say that they tend to be reductionist, and that's not a pejorative term. It's just um, uh, within these studies, we often take apart a system into smaller and smaller pieces and understand how each of those pieces work. And that's, that's really, really valuable. Um, and it's offered profound insights into the, to the texture of disparities, the, the associations of of uh, between, say, um, income and, and certain outcomes um, and uh, the role specific pathways play, say, in, in exposing people to risk associated with communicable disease. But it has led to limited understanding of 
of, of the broader system. Um, just as you could know a huge amount about cars, you could be the world's expert car mechanic, but know very little about traffic jams. So it is that you could know a huge amount about particular pathways and mechanisms, but know comparatively little about how those all come together to shape the burden of a transmissible disease in a population or um, the, um, the behavioral risk factors that are driving um, a high burden of suicides in northern communities. It's not so much just about the pieces, the biomedical understanding of depression, the biomedical understanding of uh, the impact of substance abuse on the body, but it's about how these things come together uh, to shape, uh, in shape the income or shape the outcomes. And, and um, you know, with traditional techniques, with, with statistical techniques, um, for example, we have a tremendous power associated with them. But um, there are certain areas in which they offer uh, the most insight, and there's other areas where their, their um, contributions uh, are more circumscribed. Um, and you know, when we have tightly interconnected, tangled issues, like with uh, syndemics, or when we're reasoning about multiple levels or multiple pathways um, of, of influence in, in health ecosystems, such as we have with obesity or tobacco with these nested levels of context from federal agricultural policy on down to to individual exposure to messaging and, and um, marketing, et cetera. Um, uh, traditional techniques um, have, have uh, some, um, some uh, insights to give in terms of multi-level modeling, but also some, some limitations. Um, if we're trying to understand, for example, reciprocal causality and the way in which that plays out uh, across multiple types of, of conditions. We're trying to reason about disequilibria behavior, cases where a system has been knocked out of whack by a new outbreak, for example. Or we're trying to examine the impact of novel interventions and intervention portfolios that we've never observed before and therefore where, by definition, statistical data is not available. Um, we have some challenges uh, trying to adapt directly statistical techniques uh, to these areas. And I don't think with this audience they have to go into, you know, the nested levels of context that apply in many areas. Uh, our work with uh, diabetes and obesity, for example, you know, not just a matter of, of, uh, of biomedical risk factors, but a level of uh, an issue of having to do with nested contexts, with family structure, with uh, norms, attitudes, and beliefs, um, with the uh, with with the role of, of neighborhoods and availability of food and safe perceived safety of neighborhoods, walkability, um, and uh, and even things that that affect um, the prices of food in the in the store, such as um, agricultural policy. Um, so we have you know diabetes, obesity, just layers of issues. Um, physiological regulatory processes, um, you know, surely but some biomedical components, but also diverse actors in the form of retailers and, you know, uh, agricultural producers, city planners, uh, the weight loss industry, lobbyists for, um, for uh, factors involving um, agricultural pricing, et cetera. Um, and the role of the environment, the social network, the built environment, the food environment, the communicational environment. Um, they're shifting attitudes, norms, and beliefs involving healthy weights and, and what's, uh, um, what's, what's an adequate lifestyle in terms of physical activity and sedentary behavior. Um, and, and then there's uh, intriguing issues involving gene by environment interaction that's posited as possibly playing a role or epigenetic effects and interactions with, with gestational diabetes. You know, when it comes to oral health, we see similar nested levels of context, particularly in our work in the states with uh, LA County, where um, many, of the, um, many of the outcomes on the oral health front are really shaped importantly by, um, by social context and, uh, and uh, insurance issues, issues having to do with perceived discrimination in clinics on the part of people who, who do not speak uh, good English and are under-documented, et cetera. 
Um, so once again, we have these sort of layers of issues. And you know, when we, when we have a reduction in strategy, it can give us those understanding of those pieces, but much of what we observe is, is not an aspect of those pieces alone, it's their interconnection. It's, it's not the pieces alone that are the defining pe uh, element of the system, but it's the system as a whole and that system is greater than the sum of its parts. Just like a traffic jam is, is, it has dynamics that cannot merely be reduced to, you know, the axle characteristics of a particular vehicle or, or its maximum speed. It's an, it's an interaction of, of many vehicles and driving behavior and the shape of the roads, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we can, we can um, for example, understand the effectiveness of a drug as that measured through a clinical trial. But many of the things that are going to most centrally affect the, the success of that drug in the marketplace are often things that are the very things controlled for in that trial. Um, and, and as a result, often we have, um, um, we have uh, challenges in, in trying to translate clinical trial findings into real world, uh, real world outcomes where we have a variety of other factors playing central shaping role in terms of the actual um, uh, health impact of the of the drug or of the device or of the the vaccine you know we can have profound understanding of physiology and immune function for example um, of a associated with the disease but but have limited understanding about what that means for how it <coughs> spreads in the population um, and um, as a result you know we have often an understanding of the pieces, but through traditional techniques, a limited understanding of the system as a whole. But one of the realizations from system science has been the interaction of many simple components can often lead to surprise behavior of the whole, surprise emergent behavior, where we see very different patterns of dynamics, very different patterns over time with the system as a whole than we do in any one of its pieces um, and different from the average of its pieces, for example. And uh, this is very important if we consider policy outcomes because we're interested in understanding the implications for interventions, often counterfactual interventions, and our understanding of those individual pieces, that biomedical understanding of a, of a person's risk factors and its impact on the course of their condition is going to have limited things to tell us about uh, our choice between different policy regimes. Um, now this, this uh, starts to affect us in, in broadly two big areas that I'll characterize. One is the need to explain, the need to take data empirically that we observe from the world and explain what's going on here. You know, is this evidence that I see as collected, say, by, by case reports over time for some communicable disease or from instances of diagnoses as recorded in admin data, is this supportive of my hypothesis? Um, where's the situation likely to go next? Uh, what's likely driving these patterns that we see, this rise in, in the number of reported cases of chlamydia over time here in Canada? or what's driving the rise in type 2 diabetes, for example, within our northern communities. And in some cases, uh, particularly for communicable diseases where we're dealing with reportable conditions, is this rise a good thing? Is it a, is it a sign that we're being more effective in finding cases, or is it a bad thing in the sense that the underlying epidemiology is, is, is trending in an adverse way? Um, and we all know that, uh, particularly within um, fast-moving uh, epidemiological situations such as we see in outbreaks, there's some <coughs> very interesting emergent patterns that are very different from what we see at an individual level. We see epi curves, in this case um, associated with deaths from bubonic plague in London were observed as early as the 1700s. Um, and we see for childhood infectious diseases, of course, traditionally these patterns of, of uh, of waning and waxing over time in very regular cycles that are again very different from what you see at an individual level. These are emergent patterns that we see in the population that we'd like to be able to explain. 
And if we are confined to an understanding of the pieces, we have a difficult time doing this. You know, if we try to understand the interaction of caregivers and, and children in terms of mental health issues, um, you know, we have this tangling up of the two where often um, uh, adversity on the part of a child will be reflected in, in, uh, in uh, adverse uh, trajectories on the part of the caregivers. You can get postpartum depression, for example, on the part of a mother um, leading to uh, a child's depression, which furthers the risk of continuation of the postpartum depression. At the same time, you can get a situation where child well-being is quite, is quite high and caregiver well-being as well. And so you have this sort of tangling of the two. We know since the work of Christakis and Fowler, controversial though it is, that there's some very interesting observed patterns at least um, that are seen even for chronic disease in terms of interaction of, of uh, factors such as obesity and, um, and social network effects. And we know spatial patterning, for example, within communicable diseases is very widespread and often cuts across multiple conditions. Um, spatial patterns are, are very important for certain types of conditions such as rabies, which is associated with kind of concentric patterns here in the state of Connecticut. And, you know, these patterns are, are very structured. They're very regular, but they're different from what we see in any given component of the system. And, and they reflect emergence. They reflect a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We can reduce the system to its pieces, but still not know what's going on. Even if we know those pieces in great detail, we need a, a way of putting them together and asking what's the implication for the whole. And um, importantly, understanding these emergent patterns is, is highly advantageous, even in some cases required to enact robust and cost-effective interventions. Okay? And that's the next one. <coughs> so, so if we have an understanding that's limited to pieces of a system rather than to the whole, it's hard to explain what's going on, but it's also hard to intervene, to decide what can we do best to change things. You know, um, at what stage in the process should we intervene? A prophylaxis, uh, you know, prevention, screening, um, treatment, uh, which target groups? Uh, pregnant women, um, uh, healthcare workers, um, school-aged children for, for a, a distribution of a vaccine in a prioritized fashion. How do we intervene? From an implementation science standpoint, how do we, how do we ramp up, for example? How do we make the intervention sustainable? How do we make sure that it, it, it scales at the level required to yield the benefits we're seeking? How soon shall I see the effects? There's no shortage of, of cases out there of good interventions that may have been tried out, but have been cut short too quickly and, and mothballed before they could show their effects. And it wasn't so much that they weren't effective, it's just that the anticipated time frame was off base. People thought they should see effects far quicker than nature would have it. And as a result, the intervention was judged prematurely as ineffective. Um, so when we're trying to intervene, you know, often whether we're dealing with implementation science issues or whether we're dealing with broad issues of, of targeting, we, we um, are, are, have a difficult time if we're merely reduced to, to dealing with a good understanding of the pieces. We know from, um, from uh, transmissible disease work, this work with uh, partners in, in the TB area, um, uh, looking at the effects of bridging individuals, this is TB network substructure within uh, populations in Saskatchewan. And we know that for many transmissible diseases, the network cores are of central importance for maintaining a bug circulating in the population that might otherwise go extinct based on the average, uh, the average contact rate for the population. And we also know that there, there can be disproportionate heterogeneity whereby, as it were, the tail wags the dog. A small number of frequent flyers or, or network hubs can, can have a disproportionate, a way disproportionate impact on the population 
amongst other things, for communicable illnesses, those individuals are simultaneously more likely to get infected and, given infection, more likely to pass it on to large numbers of individuals. Um, we also know from the communicable disease area most directly, but also from some uh, behavioral factors uh, in, the, in, the, in the chronic disease risk factor area, that there are tipping points. You know, if we, sometimes if we can just get to a certain point, we may be able to qualitatively change the situation. And the most obvious case of this, of course, is herd immunity, where a given level of uh, achieving a given level of um, a certain threshold of uh, vaccination coverage, for example, um, may make the difference between a childhood infectious disease being able to maintain in the population and an endemic level or effectively be, um, uh, be protected against by the population as a whole. You could get that in chronic disease. For Indeed. Example, um, say uh, colonial times Salem where there's a lot of underlying uh, problems within the network about people living in the community versus right. Sudbury where there wasn't. Right. So without that network in place. That's right. So you had this outbreak occur in Salem of a most adverse situation. My, my uh, ancestor was condemned to death as a witch, um, and uh, uh, but she got a she got spared. Um, <laughs> thank goodness the, the, the madness ended before that. Um, I probably would still be here before you if that hadn't been the case. But uh, but, um, but but whereas in Sudbury it was resistant to that, right? Um, so in the area of BFR risk factors, it absolutely occurs. In the area of, uh, you could even argue in, in certain areas like um, uh, the obesity area, um, there may be situations where the knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and norms are such where um, obesity is not able to catch hold as, as strongly as it has in other areas. And once it starts catching hold, there's the changes to what a norm of a normal weight is that can lead yeah. to it spiraling, you know, exactly. um, at, at higher levels. Which, of course, you know, sorry, I'm just thinking of that. If, you're, if you've got, uh, if you've now got a, a norm where, where overweight and obesity is much more acceptable. Right. Well, that's good in the sense of the stigma for the individual, but in a sense it becomes bad because it allows for more acceptability. Yeah, it's it's a real real uh, challenge there, and and I'm I'm grappling with that issue myself um, because uh, there's the issue of, of acceptability as norm in, in terms of, um, of of being welcoming to individuals, but then also wanting to make sure that people don't um, model after you know after after higher weights, and and I'm not uh, I don't have the requisite background to know sort of what the literature um, suggests there, but it's a very interesting issue. Um, uh, we also know that you know, there's important issues when it comes to path dependence. Um, in, the, in the chronic disease area, since the work of Barker um, uh, look at uh, effects of, of in uh, Manchester, uh, England, for example, um, we know about path dependence, you know, early life insults, um, exposure to adverse environments as a child, even um, in the Dutch famine study, um, uh, effects uh, when, when in utero can have lifetime impacts on one's trajectory. And, uh, you know, the effects of birth weight, we're finding very, very strong um, uh, associational effects you know, decades and decades later in terms of, of some of the outcomes, even when correcting for many other factors. Um, we also know wealth breeds wealth in, in many of our societies. And uh, uh, it's, it's a situation where unfortunately adversity early on can often lead to limited resource, uh, higher risk factors, and, and higher adversity later in life. So these, these factors, you know, um, uh, that, that we see that are not, that are not merely reducible to the sum of the parts raise real challenges. Challenges for learning from our experience, coordinating multiple peoples, planning and deciding um, uh, what, what interventions to put into place and designing effective healthcare systems. Um, now, uh, from a system science perspective, um, there's something we can do about these. The system science is addressing at exactly these sort of challenges. And I call it the science of the whole. And the observation here is, look, these patterns that we see, 
these patterns of concentric rings from rabies, these patterns associated with, with um, uh, effects of early life insults and later life exposures or late, later life outcomes. Um, these patterns associated with um, uh, social network effects and obesity, et cetera. Um, uh, these patterns are result from some underlying processes or are posited to, to be caused by some underlying um, uh, underlying causal structure of a system. And um, uh, these causal structures are causally tangled. Um, they, they're not neatly um, separated into different areas. But to really understand why these statistical patterns persist, uh, we need to reason consistently about the, what statisticians will call the data generating process, the processes that give rise to these patterns. To, to understand these patterns of, of fluctuations in childhood infectious diseases or the troublingly growing rates of pertussis or, or chicken pox and shingles within our societies, we, we need, to, to under, need to go beyond just the, the observed patterns to reason about what is the underlying process giving rise to them. And if we don't, we, we risk working at cross purposes with kind of the nature of things. We, worse, we risk um, you know, butting our heads against nature rather than, than working with us. So system science, the science of a whole, helps us to seek to try to visualize, understand, and reason about um, our understanding involving these processes and to test consistency with the evidence. This system science here is not a crystal ball. It's not a magic bullet. It doesn't tell us what is the case, but it more help, more quickly helps us zero in on what may be the case by falsifying theories, by helping us to, to take a theory, hold it up to the strong light of day in terms of evidence, in terms of findings from that evidence statistically, and ask, does this theory match up? Does this theory add up? to be consistent with what we know to be the case. And that's something which we're really poor about doing in our heads, but which we can do much more consistently with a computer model, okay? Um, so we use dynamic models to do this. And these, these models weave together some representation of our theories about, or hypotheses concerning how diverse factors might interact. So we can more quickly spot problems in those theories and evolve those problems. It's not so much the model being wrong is a case of a crystal ball that's flawed. It's more an issue that a model being wrong is an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to correct our thinking about the situation so that we, we are more savvy, so that we, we spotted a flaw in our reasoning that had previously eluded us. And it's only by putting in a model and seeing it seeing that it doesn't jive with the evidence that we can say, ah, you know, we, we've learned something today. So models, like we saw earlier, can help, help us reason about how things might work. Um, and they serve in that sense as a thinking tool or thinking prosthesis, something that, that helps us overcome our deficiencies in thinking purely in our head. And they serve as kind of labs for refining our thinking and help us share those assumptions with others and hold them out to the, to the scrutiny of, of, um, uh, of, of others um, who can help us refine them, critique them, et cetera. Um, now, there's a lot of science advising a system science approach. And this is such an important concept that I provided you a, a whole um, uh, a whole slide, which is just devoted to this in the materials. You know, when you're looking for problems in the world, there are some problems where uh, system science approaches are advisable, and there's many problems where it's not advisable. Uh, I spend a very large fraction of my time, as, as Winchell and Allen could talk about these days, doing machine learning analyses, computational statistics. Uh, uh, I love, you know, survival analysis, recurrent event analysis, and competing risks analysis, statistical methods are some of my most valuable tools. And there are many problems which are wonderfully amenable to those and where I won't use the system science lens. But often the findings from those I end up, I end up placing into a system science context as well. And it's to address problems like this, the occurrence of feedbacks so where there's high path dependence, there's interagent effects. There's emergence, cases where the behavior of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts their effects of scale or the effects of localized environment of people's actions and behaviors. Effects associated with networks 
disproportionate impacts of heterogeneity. We under, want to understand dynamics over time, behavior over time of a system. Um, how individual decision making is shaped by their context, by their perceived, um, their perception of the situation, by their social network, by what they see around them, etc. Where there's pronounced delays that stymie easy um, statistical relationships because of the delays involved, where there's adaptation and learning going on by agents, and when there's nonlinearities, cases where the, you know, if we double investment in intervention, it may make a qualitative difference, not merely double the outcome. These are these are important features of this system, these sort of systems. So what are these dynamic models that we've been looking at? Many of you have played around with these models. Um, some may be quite new to these models. What are they? Well, and some of you are experts in these models. These models um, represent sort of hypothesized causal relationships by which diverse factors interact with over time. Now, sometimes those, those positive relationships are those relationships, these causal relationships are posited to hold as a, for now, it's a working hypothesis about the system around us, the world out there. In other times, it's a deliberately stylized representation so we could think through the implications. We just want to think through, if it were this way, what would the implications be? Could these couple things alone explain this pattern we see in the world, for example? Very stylized depiction. In other cases, it's more articulated. It's that, you know, we think this might be a good depiction of what's going on in the world. Let's see if it's consistent with the evidence. Let's, let's see what the implications are and see if it jibes with the evidence. And these models provide a way to examine the system-wide consequences of counterfactual changes of, of these interventions. We can ask what-if questions and see how, not only how it affects the people directly affected, but their neighbors. And, you know, if we intervene upon just the low-income individuals, those who have incomes less than $400 uh, a month, how does that ripple through to the burden of illness in the population as a whole? And these models help us and other system actors to understand vulnerabilities of a system, the leverage points, where we can intervene, where we might change system structure and improve ways of, of working together. So what are these models? Well, they go by many different names. And this is one of the challenges working in this area, because you will find probably close to a dozen names for these models um, uh, out there. And if you're searching the literature, their, their contributions are spread across many literatures, even in the health area. Um, some people call them mathematical models. Some people call them causal models. Some people call them mechanistic models. Some people call them models of the physics of the system. And then there's the various subtypes, compartmental models or, or system dynamics models or state equation models or micro simulation models or agent-based models or individual-based models or, or uh, discrete event models or process-centric models. All these different names, a cacophony of names for these different things. But ladies and gentlemen, they share certain features. Names are names and labels, and they're not terribly deep. In fact, they're, they're terribly is a welter of, of different inconsistent names. But they have a certain set of things in common. They have, despite the differences, which are significant between different traditions, they share certain features. And, and specifically, um, they examine the dynamic behavior, the behavior over time resulting from hypothesized causal structure. Okay? These are mechanistic in the sense that they depict hypothesized causal structure of a system. The set of stages, natural history of infection I go through once I'm infected. Or my decision making process involving care seeking. Um, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's um, uh, the ways in which the physical activity of those around me in a network affect my physical activity. They're mechanistic in the sense that they they say, okay, what causes what causes what, okay? Um, they're not just dealing with observables, they're dealing with hypothesized latent structures that apply within the population. Now, importantly, all of these modeling types, despite the cacophony of names, they simulate the step-by-step -step evolution of the state of a system over time. And in the health area, these are typically 
state of populations of individuals over time. Those individuals may be um, people alone, or they could be um, animals. They could be, you know, animals on a farm. They could be people and uh, different sorts of animals, for example. Um, they might also include other actors, such as clinics or institutional actors, such as NGOs, et cetera. Um, and because models like this capture causality, um, posited causality, when I say captures causality, posited, hypothesized. Remember, these models are not perfect, but they help us more quickly identify the gaps, more quickly identify the inconsistencies, more quickly identify when our theories of the world, our hypothesized causal structure is off. So they put forward a theory of the world and they help us, based on that theory, check that theory, but also if we tentatively assume that theory, help us examine the impact of counterfactual situations, okay? So what's part of this model? Well, it pauses some initial state of the world, the initial state of the model, and rules for indicating how the state changes over time. Okay, now for a system dynamics model, a compartmental model, a state equation model, you can call these an ordinary differential equation model, an ODE model, they call them different names. These rules will be different in their formulation and the kind of how we describe these, how the state changes over time compared to an agent-based model. Agent-based, we might use a state chart and we might use events. On a differential equation model, we'll use differential equations that specify how how quickly a state uh, a state variable is going up or down based on the values of other state variables. But whether discrete event models, system dynamics models, agent-based models, there are some rules indicating how the state changes over time. And then, having formulated this, we can then tell the simulation framework go figure. I give you an initial state, here are some rules saying how that state will change over time. Given the current state of the system, how, how, how is it going to change over the next little bit? And we say go figure, and it plays it out over time. That's basically what's going on here for all of these types of models. You can call them whatever name you want. There are, small dif there are differences among them, but this is all in common between them, okay? So it depicts the behavior of the system over time. From this, it turns it into a, from this, it turns it into behavior over time. And, um, and uh, here, um, typically we can't predict what the system will do in, in what we say closed form. We can't just write down a formula for what it's gonna do over time. Generally, that's mathematically impossible. If they're too complex for that, they exhibit non-linearity. Which, uh, which stymies any attempt to write down ahead of time what the solution will be. Now these sorts, of mo these sorts of models are par for the course and have been used for decades in many areas of the world. Um, in many areas of engineering, designing buildings, doing training of pilots for, for airplanes, training, uh, designing streets and, and traffic flow within cities. Uh, coordination of construction processes or process plants. These things are, are just par for the course. But in the health area, they're, they're, they're newer. Um, and uh, as befits it, as a newer tool, they, you know, a lot of people are trying to grapple how do they, how do they articulate with other tools. Um, I've articulated, I think, enough, I don't have to belabor it, the idea of model as a thinking prosthesis, as something that complements our limitations of our head to help, us, to help us more quickly identify um, gaps between what we think is the case and what the empirical evidence actu actually says. Yeah, Vivian. One of the things that, going back to say, you can't do it in closed form, I think one of the yeah. things that makes this particularly important for health is because closed form models, you can do many complex things, dynamic models, but they all have to basically assume one source of uncertainty or uncertainty that moves together. You can't, yeah. and health systems, you don't just have one source of uncertainty. You have the uncertainty about protect, that particular infection, but all the other uncertainties in the environment or in the individual. And I think that's what makes that's right. it so much more particularly powerful for the health context. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a large. Uh, in order to get something close for him, as as you know, um, and probably quite a few of us in this room know and love. Um, um, if we make very simplifying assumptions, we can represent a system in a way that we can solve it. We can we can we can reason about what its possible behaviors are under a huge variety of certain circumstances. And in fact, in mathematical epidemiology, we do this a lot. We solve for the equilibria of the system, and we ask, you know, how will the disease free equilibrium or the endemic equilibrium, how will its um, characteristics depend on the the characteristic of the pathogen, and, and we can get lots of insights from that. Um, but, you know, there, uh, especially to solve something in closed form, to be able to write down how is it going to change over time, often we need to um, so simplify the system in its depiction that it loses many of its key elements. And I would argue for the sorts of features we're talking about, these complex systems features, they by themselves prevent us from being able to write this down and still retain any, any um, you know, coherent um, depiction of the essentials of those systems. So I think you're exactly right that um, it's the ability to, of these models to link up many types of uncertainty and many types of processes that are some of the most important features. Alan, would you mind getting me a bit of water here? Um, apologies. Um, uh, so, um, so you know, broadly, I think of these models. Uh, sorry for the trouble. I should have gotten it before. Uh, much appreciated. So, um, broadly, I think of these models as as learning tools, and it's not. And we have to be very cautious about this because you'll see some modelers get up there and strut and you know, talk about models as alternatives to, to, to data or to statistics, and I think that's bunk. Um, I think models help us leverage, leverage empirical evidence, leverage statistical tools, and take, the, take them further. But they're part of a milieu that includes observations from the world, includes interventions in the world and observing the outcome of the interventions, and fundamentally, a lot of it, in my mind, is about evolving our mental models. It's, a, it's evolving what we think is going on there in the world so it becomes more accurate over time, so that it's not so, um, um, so contingent on, on what we happen to have realized in our head. So Francis Bacon um, uh, said it uh, um, back in the 1600s. Um, Truth will come sooner out of error than from confusion. And what he was, that may sound very strange, that how are you gonna get truth out of error um, rather than confusion? The idea is, uh, this was his way of saying, fail early, fail often. Look, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Try something, put forward some theory and test it. Put forward some theory and, and expose it to the light of day and see if it jibes with what's observed. It's the whole idea of the working hypothesis, right? We take a working hypothesis, we advance it, we cross-check it, we try to falsify it, and if so, we've gotten somewhere. Um, and, and so it is with, with models. You know, we've, uh, we, we use modeling as a way of advancing our knowledge, in the short, learning more deeply more robustly, more reliably about the world, more quickly about the world, okay? Um, so, um, so, you know, another way I'd, I'd like to put it, it's better to be transiently wrong, you know, to advance a working hypothesis and, double, and, and, and be able to undercut it than to be perpetually confused by not, not, not going forward with anything, right? So what do we use these models for? Well, many uses. Uh, one I, I emphasized earlier was serving as a what-if tool to identify policies that are desirable. We can ask, thanks a ton, Alan. What if questions about policies um, and try to evolve policies that are high leverage, that are robust under uncertainties and that are cost effective. Um, uh, we, I do quite a bit of work with cost effectiveness modeling and, and building up models to incorporate health economics components and I've given some to you. If you're interested, you'll find a basic health economics model in that folder, for example, in the hybrid area of the folder, I think, um, which, which, and you'll find videos of me teaching that. Um, 
Uh, also, to evaluate the benefits of restructuring a system. How if we had a different reporting relationship between the provinces and PHAC with respect to communicable illnesses? Or, or what if we could restructure the ways in which information is shared across health regions in Saskatchewan for, um, for uh, STIs? Um, models can help us understand trends and make sense of, of the interaction of diverse processes, the degree to which we might be able to explain a trend with a few simple explanations. Um, models can help us investigate that. They can help us prioritize research and data collection by identifying key uncertainties that have a disproportionate impact on our choice between policies. And um, they can help us understand and generalize from observations to identify classes of whole context where certain strategies are best applied. Um, models can also, and I'm, I'm thinking here, um, uh, particularly of, of some of your interests, um, serving as communicational tools, serving as learning labs. And some of the exciting work that's been done in the states um, uh, in the area of, of building learning labs to help bring together stakeholders with, um, with models so the stakeholders can run models and use it as a forum for, for dialoguing about the system, about the underlying system. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things we'll see about the models we build here, and, and it's the reason I'm using any logic, is because it can be really useful to have a tool that's fairly transparent. I'm not saying perfectly transparent, but fairly transparent to stakeholders is you can elicit understanding that would otherwise be hidden, be tacit in their heads. Sometimes, um, you know, if you ask people questions about a system, they'll, they'll venture some things, but it's not until you sit them down in front of a model and you show them the structure and you run it for them and, and they can observe the behavior, they'll say, oh, you know, that's just what I see. That's exactly what I've seen, you know, in my experience, or whoa, that's way off. And those observations wouldn't have come up, wouldn't have been elicited from them, didn't get elicited from them until they were in front of that model and running it. That's when sometimes that tacit understanding comes out. Moreover, often having this model, it can serve as kind of a boundary object where people from different backgrounds, nurses, doctors, public health uh, officers, uh, people who are, who are involved in the, the clinical, um, clinical microbiology, they can come together and point to something in the model. And even though their languages are different, even though you know, the patient advocate is not going to be able to understand the microbiologist, by pointing at areas of the model, they know they're talking about a common area of the system. And uh, my colleague Peter Hoffman at St. Louis talks about models as boundary objects in a very convincing way. And they can indeed serve this way in a communicational context in a way that's fairly profound, I think. Um, and serve as kind of labs to test out ideas for possible health futures, as Bobby Milstein puts it. Um, they can help us aid learning you know, more quickly and, and faster from evidence. It's not models or evidence, it's models and evidence if used properly. Um, and they can, very importantly, make explicit our models of causality. Take them out of our heads where they're trapped, we're defensive about them. You don't fully understand my theory. I don't understand your theory. And they put them in front of us where we can collectively refine them. My colleague Don Burke, at, uh, who's the dean at the School of Public Health at Pitt, and Josh Epstein at Hopkins, have listed dozens of ways that models can help us um, within public health. And if anyone's interested, there's much broader lists than these. But these are some of the most important, I think. OK. Um, I'd like to use the analogy, I think it's an important one, uh, of models as maps. It's imperfect, but I think it's valuable. Um, it's, it's an important issue because, ladies and gentlemen, um, often with models, um, people fall prey to certain, um, certain common, uh, certain common uh, sort of objections with models. And I think this analogy can help overcome some of those classic views. So, Models represent, and I can use this fancy term, abstractions of features of the world around us. Those models we saw earlier, do you remember those? Those models of, of, of people um, uh, circulating with, uh, with that uh, communicable illness in, in those um, crowded environments with low income, high income, 
or in our gestational diabetes model, those models left out a huge amount of detail. The gestational diabetes model had a little bit more texture to it, an SES index, but also, you know, my birth weight and who my mother was and what, what her um, pre-pregnancy weight was, et cetera. Um, but still, it left out a huge amount of information. There was a tremendous amount it didn't have in it, right? Um, so they're abstractions of the world. They hide lots of details of the world. They, they focus on a few ones we believe certainly most salient. And this ability to omit these details makes models useful. And it's the same thing with maps, ladies and gentlemen. If you think about a map of Ottawa, um, and if I said, I really need a map of Ottawa, well, probably your first question would be, well, what sort of map? I mean, is it a, are you seeking to drive through Ottawa? Are you seeking to ride a bike through Ottawa or walk on the trails through Ottawa? Um, if I were, um, you know, an electrical engineer working for the city trying to investigate where brownouts are occurring, I'd seek one sort of map. If I want to understand where, where water is causing flooding problems, you'd give me a different sort of map. Um, so maps, like models, they're fit to purpose. They're aimed at certain purposes, and the details they will admit depend what we're trying to get out of this map, what we're trying to get out of this model. And, you know, maps, you could say that a, ma a bike map of Ottawa is wrong because it omits, you know, all the um, uh, all the details of the uh, sewer connectivity. But that wouldn't be a useful critique because it's fit for purpose. It's useful for its purpose to get from A to B via bike, and um, it's the very incompleteness that allows them to, to confer value. It's the fact that I can put it in my pocket as a bike map is because it omits huge amounts of detail. And so it is with models. To build them, models are built in, in limited time, limited budget, limited knowledge, and by nature, they have to omit certain details. It is the fact that they do omit details that, that makes them useful. The only perfect model of the world is the world. Um, but uh, they are tools for learning about what we need to put in them, about where our model doesn't match up. Um, so, uh, you know, with models, it's more difficult to ascertain a priori what information should be omitted, and there's often that learning process. Um, now, a common concern across all these models is going to be model scope. And broadly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to delineate three types of issues for these, three types of categories of things for these models. Um, there could be things that are incorporated in what I call an endogenous way. And these are quantities in the model. They're actually calculated by the model. As we run the model, the model is computing them over time. So, you know, if, if you folks will remember, I could go to something like this. And, you know, in this model, I'm going to run this. And I would argue the number of people who have uh, frank type 2 diabetes or who are overweight in this model um, uh, are those are endogenous quantities. Why? Because they are being calculated by the model over time and they are being calculated in a way that reflects, amongst other things, many things going on, including people's physical activity levels. So how many people are getting here to an obese state is the, that's, that's something which is endogenous to the model. It's not something I tell the model what to do. It tells me how many people are overweight. How many people are obese, okay? So those, <coughs> excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, are endogenous quantities. I don't tell it, it tells me. Exogenous quantities are things I tell it what to assume. This could be a fixed value. This could be, you know, ladies and gentlemen, it could be um, conditional on being pre-diabetic, the, the um, probability per year that, um, that uh, I become diabetic, the hazard rate. And it, I would, this is a representation of that hazard rate. Um, some of you may recognize this, this sort of thing, which come out of survival analysis. So I have some interest have beta plus a beta for age times the current age plus a beta for birth weight times the birth weight in grams. This is computing a hazard rate. And excuse me, um, this hazard rate itself is evolving because it's based on my age, et cetera. So this hazard rate is, excuse me, not a fixed thing. So that actually is endogenous. I stand corrected. 
in this model. By contrast, oh, this is also endogenous. I'm going to have to look for one that's um, exogenous. Oh, wow, there's a lot of endogenized things here. Let's try this one here. Um, okay, oh, man, I was, I was uh, careful with this. Okay, this fertility rate is based on age. Gosh, that's endogenous too. Um, so what thing is here? Physical activity adjustment time. Ah, there's a parameter that's just given to the model. It's told to the model. We tell the model what to assume there. Or let's say this time, um, uh, okay, this time here that it takes that a woman spends pregnant is given as nine months. Um, that's an, an exogenous quantity. It's told to the model, I just assume this. This could be a fixed quantity or it could be a quantity that's changes over time in a fixed way. We say, you know, assume the um, unemployment rate is rising through the period of simulation in this way. Or assume, <clears throat> you know, a uh, adverse food environment that's changing in this way over time. In any case, it's pre-specified. We specify it to the model ahead of time. It's not dynamically determined, okay? Um, and then finally, there's quantities that are ignored, that are left out, often consciously left out of the model. We thought about them, perhaps. We decided, okay, for now, we're going to leave them out of the model. There's no shame to that. And as will turn out, one of the big lessons of this boot camp will be build models incrementally, step by step by step. You will learn so much more. You will be less, far less likely to have real deep problems in your model, and you are likely to learn much better about where behavior is coming from and you will probably end up with a much more savvy model than <coughs> if you just planned well ahead of time where you're going to go exactly you'll have missed the opportunity to learn along the way okay um and so so ignoring things for now we put it aside maybe we examine okay you know is this something we should add in at some point and we may come back and re-examine it okay um, so there's this trade-off between simplicity and adding factors in. Now, there's several different types of modeling. Um, I'm not going to go into these any, any depths, but uh, three types supported by any logic. One is system dynamics. Um, this is a feedback-oriented perspective to help us conceptualize, describe, and manage uh, um, systems. And it corresponds to, at a mathematical level, ordinary differential equations. Um, or state equation models, okay? So this is the classic model, um, of course, of infectious disease illustrated in this, a model that harks back uh, to Kermick and McKendrick in the late 1920s and to, uh, with malaria, the work of Ross in the decade prior to that. Here we have a population. Um, uh, this is a model at an aggregate level, this particular one. We have a population divided into susceptible people, infected people, and recovered people and we count the number of people in each of these categories. So this gives a cross-sectional depiction of the population over time, the number of people in each of these categories, abstracting away from exactly who is it that's at what time and what category. And <coughs> we give rules for these rates of flow, the number of people going per week or per month from susceptible to infected. <coughs> we state how it depends on the current state of the system, okay? Um, so that's what's involved in um, these sorts of models. We give values of the stocks initially, and we give rules for these flows that specify how they depend on the current values of the stock to determine the values of the flows, and then the values of the flow determine how the stocks change over time. If a stock, a stock will rise, if its inflows are greater, some of the inflows are greater than the sum of the outflows, it will fall if it's being drained more quickly than, it, than, um, than uh, there are things coming into it. So it's a bit like your bathtub. Your bathtub will fall if the outflow rate is greater than the inflow. Uh, if you have just a trickle of water coming in, but the drain is fully unplugged, it'll tend to drain. On the other hand, if you have water gushing in and the drain is, is plugged, it'll tend to rise. And if the water's coming at just the rate as it's draining, it'll tend to stay the same. System dynamics, okay? Um, and these things turn into differential equations, which have nice features. And in mathematical epidemiology, we can solve these. And 
broadly, the features of these differential equations map directly to these underlying, these underlying diagrams. So this, for example, flow here is represented in these two guys going here. That is, this rate of flow is this divided by this parameter, and hence that turns into this equation. Now, these are differential equations. We won't be solving any of these or even seeing any of these any further during this boot camp, but you should know, because we will be draw drawing occasionally these sort of things and certainly seeing them, um, that this sort, of, this sort of methodology unpacks to these differential equations. And there's wonderful things that people with training can do with these differential equations. And I know that many of the people in uh, Pinyin's group uh, do exactly uh, this. And you can get all sorts of insight, including about possible behavior of the system for different parameter values, for different pathogens or different theories about uh, hypotheses about a given pathogen. You can get understanding about how the system might behave, OK? Um, and it turns out that there's qualitative ways of describing systems like this that are often used in participatory fashion with community members, for example, um, using what are called causal loop diagrams, which are very powerful tools for qualitatively depicting a system like this, and which can actually be linked up to these sorts of simulatable models. So there are attempts to sort of take a model like this show it in a causal loop diagram way and have the links glow with how strong that effect is right now or how big number of um, this variable is, et cetera. It can actually um, animate the systems. Okay, so we have stocks representing accumulations. We have flows between the accumulations and we have changes in them. And we can get emergent behavior that's very profound from systems like this where there's a lot of surprise and um, there can be tipping points, lock-in behavior, and et cetera. Um, and formal analysis is one of the great strengths of these sorts of models, okay? Another strength that I won't, I'm not planning to directly uh, talk about, but I'd be glad to do so if there is an, er an interest, um, has to do with some of the questions that were brought up uh, earlier by, um, uh, by, I think it was Dina, um, on uncertainty and, and dealing, grappling with uncertainty in the context of these models. And that's what are called predictor-corrector methods, which basically deal with incoming data. And even if you have a model that's grossly off, as this model is right here, when new data comes in, it kind of regrounds the model, tells it, hey, look, this is what's going on. And in many cases, although it's not shown here, this model can learn from that and say, oh, you know, my parameter estimates may be, must be off. Let me update them. Let me correct for them. So you can have sort of learning models. And I have a lecture on this if people are interested. I think I provided it to you as part of your thumb drives. And I'm glad to give it if there were interests. But basically, you're taking into account the fact that that model is fallible and updating. It's trying to learn from the data, but also the fact that data is noisy. And it's based on formal um, uh, sequential Monte Carlo methods, which are a type of of computational, um, uh, computational statistics method or machine learning method. Um, and you can do that with, with um, system dynamics models, with stock and flow models, quite a bit easier than with agent-based models, so we, though we've done it with both. Okay, so key take-home messages, they focus on feedbacks as fundamental shapers of behavior, feedbacks and, and accumulations. Um, they have some rich ways of, of depicting model structure that communicate with stakeholders. And much of the goal traditionally with system dynamics, although not the compartmental um, sort of modeling area of that tradition, is to, to help people, help stakeholders better appreciate how a system works. Um, uh, models like this um, admit to formal reasoning and analysis and are very powerful. And I would note that those models we ran this morning um, they include system dynamics elements. Here is a system dynamics element. We have used it not, not at a level of the population, ladies and gentlemen, but at the level of an individual to track a continuous attribute of that individual to wit their physical activity level. Later this week, we will be building a model which will include a depiction of this for people's weight. Their weight will vary over time 
according to their food consumption and physical activity level. So in general, system dynamics has an exquisite way, ladies and gentlemen, to describe regulatory processes involving continuous quantities. And that is a very deep thing because that can apply to agents as well as to whole populations. So if you have regulatory processes that involve metabolism and, and you know, physical activity and it, that might affect your weight over time, or if you have immune system dynamics, which whose dynamics are shaped by, by endogenous dynamics, uh, multiplication of virions and multiplication activation of T cells and, and um, multiplication of my defenses in my body for cell-mediated immunity and fighting um, uh, of, of the, uh, of the uh, T cells against the uh, free virions, we can capture those very, very nicely with um, stocks and flows as well. The, uh, the system's dynamics, yep. uh, the specialization on Corsia, uh, whatever they... Coursera? Yeah, Coursera. They, they actually get a fair bit into that mm. uh, in one of their courses in the specialization. Yeah, it's, um, it's a very... Um, it's a very powerful way of, rep of representing um, regulatory systems. And unfortunately, within the system science area, what's tended to happen traditionally is that you have different sociological groups studying agent-based model, system dynamics modeling, discrete event modeling. And traditionally, a student was lucky to have exposure to any of them, much less, but, but almost never more than one. And it's only in the past decade or so that you have people who are combining multiple types. Um, I, I happen to have been lucky because at MIT, um, actually, I, I realized the other day, I first started doing my first agent-based modeling in high school. Um, I, I didn't realize it, but I was actually doing Conway's Game of Life and, and back, back then. Um, but uh, I really started to get into seriously agent-based modeling in 1990. Um, which is 26 years ago. And I was doing my system dynamics modeling starting about 94. So I was, I was a practitioner applying both, but there was no one else I knew around at the time for decades who was doing multiple types because, and they tended to be very different camps. Um, you probably got a sense of this, Vivian. The system dynamics camp was. Put it this way. Yeah. They may have been in the same department, but they didn't talk to each other. And what, anything they said was unpublished. <laughs> yes, I, I, I share your, your observations. Well, your, your, your friend and colleague Wolfs up there That's used right. to say that they used to do outreach from their, from their micro simulation. They'd go to all the systems dynamics uh, meetings, mm. but they could never break the orthodoxy. So. The, the, it's, it's an unfortunate um, yeah. fact. Um, yeah. Just because, but I'm, I'm interested what you said about regulation. I mean, we're not the regulatory department. No. Our colleagues. No. Canada are, but there's definitely interface on, on a lot of important issues, right? In terms of the tool, and, and when you're talking about a suite of tools and methods yeah. Yeah. Um, to get effect, like in, as from the lessons of tobacco, um, adaptation is such a, a yeah. huge factor, and and I, being able to model adaptation is is definitely something that would be interesting to us. Yeah, and I, I, so I, I share that sense, learning and adaptation. We know how big an effect it shapes in people's behavior, in people's knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. But also the market, also, like, you know, that's when, right. when, whether it's cigarettes or alcoholic products or, yep. or sugar-sweetened beverages, even in Mexico since, yep. since in the year of their tax, mm. because they taxed on the volume and they right. taxed it at the men, which we all know from alcohol, you know, that's what you taxed on the target. Already, their substitution of what, what oh. sort, what inputs they're using, they're trying to shift so that the tax goes on the the per the, the small things, mm -hmm. the big volume. Anyways, it's the, those things are predictable, but economists can predict where some of those adaptations would be. But we just when we do a standard economic model, we just say, well, the sh the curve will shift. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. So being able to model model that more broadly might be more helpful. Right. Yeah, and I think I think system dynamics models, um, if you are thinking about some sort of regulatory process, whether at the whether at the broader level or at the level of, of, of within a person, 
they really bring a lot to the table. And it's an area that the, the Asian-based modeling literature, I think, hasn't fully, um, fully nearly learned from from the sort of regula regulatory insights. And I'm talking regulatory processes in general, but you know the market and, and governmental regulation are, are a very important case, but there's a lot to learn there. Um, Agent-based modeling is where we're gonna be spending most of our time, ladies and gentlemen. So here, what do we have? We have one or more populations composed of individual agents, okay? So we have populations, and we describe that population with, you know, person classes, it describes personhood with respect to our population, and and uh, maybe the clinic hood, you know, with respect to our pre presentation. So these populations of agents, right? There's many, there's one theory of a person, but then there's many particular people who, who, um, who are characterized by that theory and differ in terms of parameters, you know, their, their, their age right now or their, their income level or, or their um, sex or what have you. They differ in their state. Um, maybe their age is evolving, in which case that would be an aspect of, 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 a, of state. Their smoking status, their preferences, their current infection status, their care-seeking status. Um, and some rules for changing that state over time, for changing that state based on their own incurable characteristics and characteristics of those around them, and some ways of interacting, ladies and gentlemen, with other agents um, across an environment. So maybe it's a spatial environment, a GIS type environment, or maybe it's networks um, that they're embedded in. Maybe family networks and social networks, or maybe needle sharing networks and sexual transmission networks and social networks that affect norms, attitudes, beliefs. There's some time horizon and there's some initial state for the model, okay? Um, now, this is quite a difference from system dynamics characterization at a high level. And I, I think it may, it may bear some characterization, especially because I know some people here have experience with um, aggregate characterizations of populations using stocks and flows, which is a very powerful mechanism seen in system dynamics. So here we have a population in system dynamics, and this population is characterized, it's divided up. In short, ladies and gentlemen, it's organized according to people's state and characteristics. So we put people in different boxes and count the number of people who have a certain state. Count the number of susceptibles, count the number of exposed, count the number of effectives, count the number of recoveries. And ladies and gentlemen, importantly, if we needed to separately maintain women and men, maybe we're dealing with an STI, for example, we, we might have kind of two layers of this model, one for susceptible males, one for susceptible females, one for exposed males, exposed females. In fact, the males, in fact, the females recovered males, recovered females. That's how we deal with heterogeneity in these sort of aggregate models, okay? So the point is, we organize it according to their characteristics, their state, their SES, or what have you, okay? And then each stock counts the number of people who have that characteristic, that state and, and, and characteristic. Um, by contrast, um, ladies and gentlemen, Within agent-based modeling, um, we do the reverse, okay? We, instead of organizing the model by characteristic, the model is organized according to individuals. We just, each, each individual is a separate agent. And each individual keeps track of their own characteristics, keeps track of their own state, keeps track of their own, their own parameter values, okay? And ladies and gentlemen, um, <coughs> here, <coughs> rather than having a, um, uh, a situation where we have a duplication of the model when we add a new characteristic for a person, rather than <coughs> taking this and creating two layers of it for males and females, all we do is we add a characteristic to the person, an extra parameter for that person that says, you are male, you are female. It's just one, one, one characteristic of sex um, we, we can associate. So it's not nearly as cumbersome to add heterogeneity into our model. One of the real strengths of agent-based models and individual-based models in general is we can keep track of, of heterogeneity. There's many others as well, including the ability to keep track of individual histories over time. 
A system dynamics model, an aggregate model, gives a cross-sectional depiction of the population over time. We might have at time, time 100, 100 days in, say, 500 people infected. 100 days later, time 200, we might have, we have 500 people infected. And in a system dynamics model, you can't really, in general, you can't really ask legitimately, are those the same 500 people? It's just 500 people. Um, they're anonymous people. We don't keep track of their histories over time as they circulate. It's a cross-sectional depiction. Whether it's the same or different 500 people, in general, we can't really ask questions like that and get a good answer. Um, there are special cases, but in general, we can't get a good answer from that. By contrast, ladies and gentlemen, in an agent-based model, we can. We actually have a, we, we can get a cross-sectional depiction, but we can also get a longitudinal depiction at the level of an individual. Individual trajectories are traced, okay? So, Sysma Dynamics model organizes the model by characteristic and counts. The, the data is the count of the number of people at each place. By contrast, an agent-based model organizes the model by individual. The data is their characteristics, their state and parameters. Okay, so a, a big difference. So, you know, we have some population, a theory of personhood, one theory of personhood, and then we have many particular people um, put down. Each of those people are associated with some parameters. So the theory of personhood has some parameters in it. So each of these people has certain values of those parameters, right? Yeah. Um, uh, each person is going to be associated with state and rules for evolving state. We saw that earlier, remember that? We saw these sort of things. So this depicts the states with respect to infection. Well, have different state charts for different types of concerns. So we might have infection concerns, we might have care seeking concerns, we might have risk attitude concerns, we might have concerns involving some chronic diseases or different co-infections, you know, hep C and HIV, for example. And ladies and gentlemen, so we have these states, and then we have some rules for evolving the states. Whoa, whoa, I don't want that. Um, rules for evolving the states. Those are associated with these, these little things here. And starting this afternoon, you're going to be building your first state charts, just like this. You're going to be building them up, and you'll see it's pretty straightforward to do. There's only so many building blocks, so many moving pieces. And you'll see, for example, what one of these, this is a hazard rate here. This is something based on a certain amount of time after someone becomes infected, they recover. And this one is a message. It indicates some sort of thing that sort of is impinging upon them. Like in this case, it's treatment mediated recovery. They recover based on a treatment, okay? Yeah. Now, right. in, if, if, if the interaction matters like in an infectious disease. Yes, between have, these state charts. Yeah, so you'll be some linking. We'll feature that. Take, right? we'll, we'll feature that, yeah. Potentially before the day is out. Wow. Um, but in any case, by tomorrow morning at the latest, okay? By the, by the way, how's your voice holding? Uh, the voice is, is uh, uh, good. Um, to, to help lend context to Ron's. You keep that water going on. Thank, thank you, Alan. I, I, uh, Thank you, Nurse McLean. I, I, I was predicting Wednesday afternoon it was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, good call. Um, so, a bit of context to that. Um, last week, at this time, I was I was in bad shape with the flu. Um, and that lasted till about uh, Friday. I had to, actually had a trip back to back with this one that I had to cancel my, my, my flights. And uh, made it here by hook and crook um so that was that was a fortunate thing good call that, um came my recovery came just in time yeah but also so you know you take your breaks or your lunch wherever yeah. you feel it's best for you uh, appreciate it appreciate it. it's holding up quite well so here we have two different state charts and we can capture interactions between them um in a quite natural way it turns out so we'll see how that can be done right so in other words someone's care-seeking behavior might impact the, the availability of treatment-mediated recovery, among other things, right? Okay, so 
state, these state charts are going to help us characterize state and rules for evolving state. One other way, though, it's more advanced, but we'll see it in the hybrid modeling, that we could characterize an aspect of continuous state and evolution of continuous state is through stocks and flows. We can actually have, although it's not part of the traditional agent-based modeling vocabulary, um, it's a perfectly good way of describing agent behavior. We can associate a continuous characteristic like their weight or their <coughs> level of T cell, uh, activated T cells or free variants in their body or we, we might characterize their uh, current income as a continuous quantity and have stocks and flows into and out of it, which affects over time in a gradual way how these things evolve. The metabolic processes such as Kevin Hall has documented in the, in the, in the uh, physical activity area and, and resting met metabolic rate and de novo, de novo lipogenesis, et cetera that affect uh, people's weight regulation over time. We can characterize that in a stock and flow model very elegantly. Um, okay, and finally, we provide them with a means of interacting with other agents, oft with networks, sometimes with spatial characteristics, okay? Um, this is a model of chronic wasting disease um, that I'll, I'll uh, hope to, to show you. I don't think it's in the, at the group by I gave you there, but showing deer wandering over a landscape. Um, this model is a big eye opener for me. Uh, we had a stock and flow model, a system dynamics model of chronic wasting disease that I was, I was rather partial to. We had built it, we thought it was quite good. And what we had done there was, you know, we had um, representing deer according to levels of chronic wasting disease, and we had um, prions. Um, as building up on average across a certain landscape. Um, and, and then as a class project, some students of mine, one of my classes, a student who's now at PEI, incidentally, uh, Gregor McEwen, they built up this, um, this model of chronic wasting disease. And they had deer, an individual deer, and the deer exhibited food-seeking behavior, exhibited water-seeking behavior. Fawns stayed around their mothers. Um, the, uh, the deer had seasonal grouping patterns. They tended to travel less in the winter because of the snow, et cetera. And beautiful little model, and I'm happy to show it to people. In any case, um, uh, they ran this model for me, and my eyes just totally opened up because it, basically I said, okay, that old model, as it had been formulated, it was, it was not very useful because in that model, we kind of assumed, well, as, a, as an innocent assumption, we'll assume prions are spread over the landscape equally, over the, the region. And when I saw this, I, man, the prions are not spread equally. And there's a nonlinear dose response relationship that's likely with prion exposure and risk of infection. So, you know, the, that relationship applied to the mean is not the same, but the mean is the relationship applied to the distribution of prions. These prions are highly concentrated in certain vulnerable areas. These are the areas where they go to drink water, the areas where they go for, for eating good grass or what have you. And as a result, you, you get a disproportionate risk associated with prion spread associated with these areas. So spatial patterning matters. And whether it's more stylized or more, um, uh, more textured, um, and we'll see some pretty nice GIS ones uh, before the week is out. Um, spatial environments matter. They matter for, um, you know, uh, walkability of environments, uh, the, the impact of the built environment is in, in terms of the, uh, the, the perception of safety. Um, we know these things affect physical activity. Um, it also matters for availability of food, the food environment. Um, <coughs> For certain types of uh, communicable illnesses, um, it may be associated with uh, risk of airborne transmission, for example, in, in poorly ventilated areas, <clears throat> etc. Um, you can get, you know, real transmission. I know a colleague of mine was telling me about TB in North Manitoba, which was disproportionately spread by certain closed spaces um, uh, associated with youth 
youth um, entertainment and so on. So the point is uh, spatial environments matter. Unfortunately, any logic has some really nice support for GIS. Really nice support that's been rolled out in version seven and has gotten, um, it's gotten quite good. So we'll be spending quite some time on that on uh, day four, I think, and um, we'll see some other spatial environments. Okay, um, now in contrast to system dynamics models, um, um, uh, agent-based models are typically stochastic, okay? You can have stochastic agent uh, system dynamics models, and I've built my share of them. Um, <coughs> in both these areas, I've built probably hundreds of, of models of each sort. Um, but uh, because, uh, because agent-based models are typically stochastic, they're stochastic because they're articulated often at a finer grained level. And things at an individual level often have more stochastics in terms of individual behavior. So um, in order to make sure model results, a given run of the model that has shown interesting results is not merely a fluke, we typically run the model many times. And the technical term for this is we run a Monte Carlo ensemble. We run it for many realizations. We run it again and again and again with different random number vagaries, okay? Um, and fortunately, this is easily done in parallel. Any logic will do it for you in parallel on your computer um, across different so-called cores. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes this can yield real insight. It's not merely a nuisance that you gotta go through. Sometimes seeing the variability in results can give real insights into variability in the real world that you see. Um, there are... So would that be like a black swan? Well, um, th it could be, but there's, there's also what, like, uh, I'll give you a case. So a colleague of mine and I, Roland Dick, we have um, a long series of papers on the link, um, well, in, in looking at type 2 diabetes uh, in Saskatchewan, particularly. Um, particularly related to the link of, of gestational type 2, but also some things in end-stage renal disease. And one of the papers we were working on, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we were looking at end-stage renal disease in children, okay? And we were looking at um, uh, age-specific rates for end-stage renal disease in children. And one of the things that we saw was a troubling upwards trend but it was very puzzling because there, were, there was an overall trend upwards, so it's quite distinctive. But then there'd be trends where for a couple of years in a row it would decline markedly. And then it would go up and decline markedly and go up. And, and we had this paper where we were analyzing some of the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, epidemiological analyses and we were positing you know, rising, rising rates from that based on incidence rates um, that were observed. But both of us had this sort of feeling, okay, something's going on here we don't get in terms of these sudden declines. It would decline for a couple of years and then it would go up again. <coughs> and so, you know, I decided, although the prime, we have a very nice end-stage renal disease model, which I have shared with you, um, if any of you are interested, but, um, but um, I decided, even though this particular paper wasn't a modeling paper per se, the best, one of the best ways I could get an understanding of this, these trends, these sort of variations, was to build a little agent-based model, okay? So I built an agent-based model, and this model did not attempt to predict, uh, to, to exactly depict in precise terms the epidemiology of end-stage renal disease and, and diabetes. All it did is it had a very simple little test. So basically, I depicted children, children aging, children being subject to increasing risk of diabetes and, and, and then with diabetes, increasing risk of entry of renal disease. And I summarized from the model in age-specific terms, I summarized the rates, mm -hmm. okay? Just like, just in a way that mirrored the data I was getting from the world. So I had the model population and data coming out of it, and uh, it was summarized in just the way the data was coming from the world. The difference is, and this is really important insight about modeling, the difference is in the model, I knew of course exactly what was going on. I had told the model to assume actually rising rates of diabetes and rising rates of end-stage renal disease over time. 
I knew that the rates were in fact rising. And what I wanted to see is, were these same patterns of decline several years in a row and, and rise, were those going to come out of this model? Or was that something other, some other processes that need to be explained in the world? Um, so I ran this model, and it, it just struck me, just like that prion data. I saw exactly those things. And where did it come from? It came from the fact that these were age-specific rates. Right. And so they were like five-year rates. So if you had a disproportionately large number of, of kids coming in some year by stochastics, guess what? Five years later, a large number of individuals leave suddenly, and you get a decline uh, in, the, in the numbers of the age-specific rates right. for those years. Large cohort coming in, large cohort leaves. And, and so you tended to see this kind of overall trend, but this sudden declines for a couple of years and rise. So that exactly allowed us to sort of account for these patterns that we saw epidemiologically. So within the strata, yeah. things were continuing as you, you would have thought. But That's in right. aggregate, because of the... Exactly. Mix. Exactly. Yeah. So we knew the true situation was what it, for the... We knew the situation in the model, the synthetic ground truth, was, was definitely rising rates. And yet we saw these exact same... Um, sort of artifacts that we saw in the data from the world, and we tracked it down to age-specific, the, the specifics of age-specific rates, you know, to lineate, and how they treat cohorts and so on. So anyway, that was an example of, of how variability can be helpful. So any one run of the model is going to yield certain outcomes, say in the number of low SES cases or high SES cases, but then if you run the model many, many times here, you will get distributions. So what was a single outcome for low SES over different runs of the model becomes different possible ones. And they're not necessarily unimodal, right? You might have some where there's no low SES cases at all, <coughs> but most of the time you have quite a few. And so you get these kind of distributions out. Um, in this case, it's showing a histogram. If we ran it many, many more times, this is, I think, 200, 65 um, uh, runs here, but if we had run it many, many more times, we'd see uh, often a, a, a somewhat smoother distribution. And this shows sort of over time a distribution in results as to the number of low SES and high SES kids um, or individuals over time. Um, one thing that we will feature if there's interest here, um, I was thinking about it for our Zuanota colleagues, is uh, hierarchical um, uh, ABMs. Um, quite fun to build. Um, you can build ABMs in contrast to system dynamics models where it's not, it's, it's not really advisable or, or it's not really readily doable in a nice way. You can build uh, models in, um, in agent base models that are hierarchical. In other words, they have multi-levels of structure. And these can be very desirable. You might have, for example, individual individuals in families nested in neighborhoods nested in a city right in the city in a region you can have many levels and you might be interested in stochastic or excuse me statistics at multiple of those levels that are distinct as you might be able to compare with multi-level modeling um, you know hierarchical linear models that would look at effects at different scales or you might have processes that operate at the neighborhood level or the city level that are distinct from processes of the family or individual level. So we can capture quite nicely in a nested fashion. What I mean by that is cities have within them, neighborhoods have within them, families have within them, individuals, in a very neat sort of crisp fashion. And it turns out in any logic, it's, it's very nice to do. So what are some notable strengths of ABMs? We're just about done here. Well. They can represent network spatial context in this multi-level nesting. Um, they can allow for often really nice endogenous characterization of intervention effects and implementation science effects in a very crisp way. They can capture situated decision making. The fact that I as an individual, you know, if I'm making decisions about university and I'm from a poor background, my social network that advises me on my decision making might, um, might uh, affect my ability to make prudent decisions about 
where to go to university, for example, well, compared to an individual. Family. I mean, in my case, That's right. as an engineer, uh, initially, my father was an engineer, and all the people he pretty well knew were engineers, maybe in your case as well. But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that narrows your view of the world. Cause, that's uh, right. You know, uh, that's right. That, that's exactly right. So, um, so these things affect us. And, you know, age-based <coughs> models have long been used in things like simulating driving behavior because you could simulate, from the perspective of a given driver, what they see around them what cars are in front of them, what they see out the rear view mirror, et cetera, and therefore capture their braking behavior, et cetera, much, much better than you could if you model as a fluid or something like that. Um, uh, they can capture continuous and discrete heterogeneity, you know, my weight status at birth in a continuous fashion rather than just weight categories. And uh, they can capture, for example, uh, targeted interventions that, that target heterogeneity or where we're interested in transfer effects between different, um, between different um, uh, sub areas of the, um, of the, of, of the uh, population, different subgroups. Um, they can capture longitudinal information, information on a person's history over time, and visualization can be very powerful for agent-based models. Visualization over space, over networks, of an individual in the population, of aggregated data for the population, sliced and diced in different ways, can be very uh, effective. And they can serve as synthetic ground truth. We could kind of assess measures, assess study designs, assess statistical uh, proxies for certain factors in an underlying population and test them with an agent-based model because we can formulate sort of similar <coughs> similar um, situation to what we might do in the real world and see are there gaps, are there cases where it gives uh, problematic results, et cetera. Okay, the final type of modeling that we will see is discrete event modeling. In fact, we saw this earlier today with our clinics. This is a process driven. I sometimes have called it process centric modeling. I prefer now to call it workflow centric modeling because it posits a certain well-defined workflow. Maybe this is workflow associated with working up a patient. Maybe it's associated with working up um, an animal for a vet. Maybe it's associated with paperwork for enrolling someone in a, uh, a treatment program for vets. Um, it's not necessarily they're there in person, although often they are. And the point is that this workflow is resource constrained. And that's where this type of modeling really shines. So we have a defined workflow. Individuals flow through that workflow, but their ability to progress, ladies and gentlemen, in that workflow is contingent upon availability of resources. What might these resources be? They could be fixed resources, such as an MRI scanner. They could be uh, availability of a procedure room, a surgical operating theater. Um, uh, they could be availability of a bed in a, in a ward. Or they could be a, a mobile resource, availability of a mobile ultrasound machine, for example. Um, availability of a um, ophthalmo, ophthalmic uh, sort of inspection device. Um, or they could be mobile resources you know, with agency, things like doctors, nurses, um, and uh, and uh, physician's assistants, et cetera. Um, so uh, these resources are often needed at key places of this progression. So in order to get examined by the doctor, the doctor has to be available. And if the doctor's not available, I wait. I wait in a queue. And discrete event modeling takes care of all of this in a beautiful way for you. It, it takes care of queuing you up, keeping you waiting. When the doctor becomes available, now you get seen and then you're done, you progress on, and then maybe you're waiting for the availability of the, of the nurse to do the post, you know, the, the post uh, workup um, uh, procedures, and you're waiting for her, and then she's available, or he's available, and, and then you progress on. So there's queuing that's captured. Um, uh, these processes operate on people as long as the resources are available and they wait otherwise. Um, <laughs> and often there's 
limited resources available, so you, you, you do have to wait. Um, so this sort of modeling uh, has a very defined focus. Um, it dates back to the 1950s with uh, work of Carl Tocher and, and others in the general simulation program. Um, but um, where it really excels is the ability to, to crisply represent processing in the context of limited resources and to identify resource placement, availability, coordination of resources, level of resourcing, facility layout um, that might impact uh, waiting times um, or waiting, um, uh, waiting delay. So waiting times, waiting queue length, um, the presence of weights, et cetera. It does have lower reliance on computational skills than agent-based agent modeling. Okay, um, a, few, a few words before we close here for lunch. Um, one is, you, you should realize, this is a very important point, ladies and gentlemen, models come in a spectrum of uses. This is a point I tended to not emphasize before, but I've learned, although it's conceptual, it's, it, it's really one for understanding the cacophony of models you'll find out there in the literature and that you'll see. There are models that are highly stylized and models that are rich and empirically grounded. And you will find, whether it's system dynamics, agent-based, or discrete event modeling, you will find models on both sides of the spectrum. There can be agent-based models, for sure, that are highly rich, empirically grounded, informed by data, and um, that you know have been informed by all sorts of latest evidence, and which depict individual behavior in a way that's in accordance with best understanding from from the literature, from big data. On the other hand, there can be stylized models of agent-based, such as the se Schelling segregation model, which are extremely powerful and insightful, but which, which don't seek to depict you know, the population of, of Ottawa, for example, as it is out there. They don't seek to depict Detroit or Watts or LA, you know, in LA um, or, or Chicago, but rather they're, they're they're sort of a depiction in a more caricatured fashion. It's like a caricature. It captures certain essential truths about the situation, you know, a big chin or a jutting nose, such as have, uh, have um, uh, characterized uh, cartoons of previous prime ministers. Um, and, uh, but they capture certain essential sort of features of the situation. These models are sometimes called theoretical models or modeling for insight simple models. The point is they try to teach us lessons that are not depiction of one specific epi context, but rather help us understand, think through certain simple assumptions and what their implications are. And the Schelling segregation model has been incredibly profound in its, um, sh in its uh, opening up our eyes to how segregation can arise from very simple factors. It doesn't take positing very complex relationships between residential steering and predatory lending and you know deep bias on the part of individuals throughout the population but even very modest preference levels on the part of individuals can lead to pronounced uh, patterns of that we call segregation <coughs> and it's a very stylized model that gave rise to it um, it's not to say it's a perfect depiction of any one city it's not but it, it's a thinking tool. It's a thinking prosthesis that helped us think through things. So when you see a model, one of the things you gotta ask is, where on this spectrum does it try to aim? You know, is it a stylized model or is it an empirically grounded model? In this class, in this boot camp, naturally because we're building up models together and we need to keep them simple enough to do in a defined time, mostly fairly stylized, although I'm hoping to give you some sense about how they could gravitate to over here. And that model I showed you with the, eight, with the, um, with the gestational diabetes, it had some components with those betas that could be estimated through, through competing risks analysis or, or um, survival analysis. It could be over getting, going over to that quadrant with appropriate data. So what are some purposes of stylized models? Why would you build a stylized model? Um, could the observed pattern that we see have a simple explanation? Um, 
uh, we might use a stylized model to try to identify robust, robust surveillance strategies or screening approaches or study designs in terms of assessing how could we avoid certain big gaps in our, in our prox designing our proxies for measuring things. Are there certain ways we could, that, that uh, if we undertake a certain study design, we might miss certain effects overall? What are the logical implications for the observed data interactions of just a few simple assumptions? Um, or in other words, for the observed data. If we make a few simple assumptions, what would that suggest in terms of what we should see? Um, you know, and what sort of phenomena or long-term behavior might result from these, um, from these simple assumptions? Um, uh, where might this, where, and I emphasize this, where might the system be most sensitive to intervention? or to making data available. And this would be sort of a sensitivity analysis. A stylized model can help with these. If we want to take it to the next level in terms of specificity, go from where should we intervene to how should we intervene, often we want an empirically grounded model that's more, more detailed. And for these, you know, we might ask, you know, what would the quantitative health or cost outcome trade-offs be between intervention A and B? Um, we might perform cost effectiveness analysis and plot the results of interventions on a CE plane in terms of incremental cost effectiveness ratio. Um, how, how might we most effectively intervene in the system compared to merely where in the system? Um, uh, where can we expect to be a certain amount of time from now by following this intervention? Um, we want to be quite specific about our intervention, its rollout, at the implementation science aspects. At what point will this intervention be self-sustaining? How far out into the future? For these empirically grounded models, that advise it. So stylized models can get you off the ground, get you going often early, but certain types of questions, to really address them well, you really want an empirically grounded model. Okay? And, um, and, you know, something like POEM, the poem model, um, life paths, definitely I'd put it over here. Um, although I would argue there may be certain components of it involving physical activity or something that, that have their stylized uh, elements. But, you know, there's many other models that, that, are, that gravitate towards the, the left side here. Okay. They, they actually describe poem as a data driven, which fits yeah. nicely with rich. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, you know, Michael Wolfson often will use the term industrial strength for it. And, and I've got to say, I think they, they have a lot, a lot of strengths there. I would argue, though, that in certain respects, in terms of depiction, say, of behavioral factors and so on, it's, it's making certain assumptions about um, associations obtaining in the future that that you know are not really robust under um, possible behavioral changes and so on, and in which case some aspects of it, even so, might be have some stylized components. Well, I mean, they can't nest because well, as yeah, well, they as don't have was, interaction. Right? Well, it was um, life paths was um, mm. separate, so you couldn't put the individual within the household within the community. It's um, so mm. That, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so what? And so you know, and that's so because of the original architecture being that there's some of the more early models. Yeah. They haven't come together in a way that you can, shall we say, transit from the agent based. Yeah. In with the layer, and then take that up to the macro. Got it. Yeah, and that's that's where, um, and and. Right. Yeah. Totally. It, uh, and, and well, the strong independence on that one has always been a challenge for me. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's intriguing as you, as it goes across the life course. Mm -hmm. you, you face probabilities of things happening that you're continuously updating the model for changes in risks, disease. Right. And so, and so it's those it's those operators on yeah. looking around you and then right. saying how at the end of this time period yep. do you update your risks? Which right is a way to handle the getting around the strong independence but right. as you say it's it's what what are those models that are are, right. are updating is is really critical that's right, right. cuz yeah. it doesn't take into account adaptation any network effects so so right. so the uh, 
emergence at a population level occurs to uh, uh, how you alter uh, the risk factors and other things over the life course of the micro right. individual agents. But that's it. You know, so you're emerging with right. a new pattern, but it's not taking into account behavior, which is ultimately what we're trying to get at. Exactly. Why in exactly. My, my work, I really, I like poll because it's robust and, it and you can, if you learn how to code, you can start to tease out interesting things that are built in that <coughs> are uh, views. But it, it'll tell you how much you could, a target you could achieve. If you could reduce right. BMI or, or whatever by a certain amount in the population or its distribution, yep. great. It doesn't tell you how to get there. That's right, exactly. And how to get there is often a matter of how are we gonna change people's behavior so that you know, exactly. you know, what sort of, it's almost a, a mechanism design issue. You know, how are we going to design an intervention and implementation strategy for that intervention that is going to, that is going to achieve these things? That, that's but, a deeper question, and, yeah. But for me, I'm saying yeah. not an intervention, I would say a suite Portfolio of interventions. Portfolio of interventions. It's yeah, a suite yeah, of yeah. interventions, yeah. and with yeah. suites, yeah. All, and the interaction of those suites, all yeah. the more you're gonna see that emergent behavior, because it may be that it's the suite right. coming, what, you know, finding, right. being yep. able to run the Monte Carlos to figure out what's the optimal suite is where we'd really like to be ideal right. in the end, but that's, that's a tough one. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I'll see if I can come back to that yeah. later, later in the week, but one issue is, um, you know, it, it, it worth, it's worth emphasizing, and I, I think this actually discussion has been a really good one, and I apologize for those who are not familiar with POEM here, but one issue is when you have empirically grounded models, just because a model has a lot of empirically estimated coefficients in it is not to say that, you know, it is a, it is a guaranteed to be a much better predictor of the situation, because yeah. some of those coefficients that are hard-coded into it may itself posit, you know, unchanging behavioral patterns compared to what we see today or what have you that are, that, that are problematic assumptions going forward. And the point is that even these are not without vulnerabilities. Now, they're good. They're, they're learning tools, right? They help us learn from the evidence. They help us think through what this evidence is, but one has to be very careful um, in taking any models a crystal ball. One has to be very careful sort of saying, oh, you know, this, this is the full, the full, full on depiction of the full situation, you know, because it, it's not going to be, it's going to have gaps and you've got to be thinking, what are those gaps? Where, where are the areas where this model's making great simplifying assumptions? And often you'll find that it's down there where they assume certain relationships between driving this factor or that factor. So these different system science methodologies that I surveyed, discrete event modeling, agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling. Well, we'll focus on agent-based modeling for the sake of this boot camp quite assiduously. Um, these types of modeling methodologies are highly complementary, and no one of them you know, replaces the others. Um, they seek to answer different types of questions often, and uh, real synergies can be secured by, by combining them. And um, it, depending how the time goes, I may give a lecture on hybrid modeling, um, which highlights five really powerful hybrid strategies that we've used in our work that I think are absolutely compelling. And where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You take two strategies, you put them together in a model, and you get something out that no one of those strategies would give um, with real compelling benefits. And um, that, that uh, hybrid folder within the example models area, you'll find it illustrating many of these strategies. Um, okay, so a couple of take home messages. I know this has been concept dense, um, and I apologize. We're gonna get back to hands-on modeling work immediately after lunch, okay? A lot of building up models. By the end of the day, you will have a set of concrete skills with any logic building up models and have a much greater, greater sense of how do you build these models. But a couple take home messages. First of all, addressing many practical challenges is, is hard. 
especially in intervention design and explaining patterns we see in the world, it's, it's hard because systems exhibit features of complex, of complex systems, the whole, where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We know a lot about the pieces, but sometimes it leaves us little understanding of the whole. Um, again, just like a mechanic knows all sorts of things about all these models of cars, is left for months by why there's a traffic jam, you know, forming every day at 3 p.m. at that intersection or that, you know, bend of the highway. It's not just about the pieces, it's about how they interact. System science provides us with tools to represent and reason about behavior of complex systems. These systems are the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And models, they are not crystal balls, they are not silver bullets but they are, provide a way to express in an explicit form, in, a, in an operationalizable form, a way that we could see its implications, dynamic hypotheses about processes underlying observed behavior. And, and because it's explicit, we can share it with others and get it critiqued, refined, and advanced. And because it's operationalizable, we can run it and see what the implications are and see if they jive with empirical evidence. We could see, does this add up? Does this match what I see in the world? And it can spot inconsistencies that we didn't know were there between what we think is going on in the world and, and the empirical evidence. Inconsistencies we never would have found if we couldn't run the implications of our, of our, of our hypotheses. These models can help us understand what's going on in the world, why do we see certain patterns, and, and how interventions might affect things, including counterfactual interventions, interventions for which there's not yet statistical data available, but we want to realize, you know, reason about what the impact is and, and how different interventions uh, interact. Models are specific to purpose. You're not going to model, you know, Ottawa. You're going to model certain aspects of Ottawa for certain purposes, and it'll be a different model for for understanding pertussis risks in Ottawa than it will be for understanding um, uh, the growth in, in, in obesity in children in Ottawa. Um, and multiple and hybrid modeling types are complementary for describing complex decision-making challenges. So um, concept rich, uh, I apologize um, for um, the heavy, heavy contents here. After lunch, we're gonna have a lot of fun working on some models you're gonna have built, by the end of the day, you're gonna have built at least three full working models. Okay, so uh, look forward to seeing you uh, after lunch. What time would you like us back? Um, let's see, uh, so you're gonna have to um, constrain my, my thinking now. It's 12.30 or so, yeah, right? It's 12.30 uh, uh, we're, we're Kind of at a good spot because uh, there's some turnover going on in the local restaurants or what have you. So, uh, uh, can we get back within an hour? Or is that too tight? I should be able to. It depends yeah. on what people want. I mean, but there's lots of restaurants around here. As I said, there's uh, uh, Nico's, which is great. Uh, so there's, there's lots of takeout. And there's lots of lots yeah. of takeout. Lots of sit down. Uh, not too far away. It depends on what you want. If you want to sit down, you're better off going to Woods Preston and seeing what's there. If you like takeout, there's uh, on Rochester. There's Nico's. There's Morning Owl. Make really great sandwiches and uh, and soups. We're really running low. Uh, and then if you want to go for Tim Hortons, you can go to the NR Can Building and get a coffee pass. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if people have any preference to sort of.